I'm Professor Pat Murphy, and I'd like to welcome you to the second Burgess Lecture for the fall 2008. Before uh, introducing our speaker, uh, Bob Nyheis, I'd like to just share with you a couple tidbits about Herman Miller. Uh, Herman Miller, as you can see from the graphic there, is headquartered in Zeeland, Michigan. But uh, on their website, it says, Herman Miller strives to create a better world around you with inventive design services that enhance the places where people work, heal, learn, and live, and through a commitment to social responsibility. And on their website, uh, September 4th, they were uh, given a perfect score in the corporate equality ranking by the Human Rights Campaign Foundation. On September 5th, it was their uh, fifth consecutive placement in the Dow Jones Sustainability World Index, only 300 firms, and they're the only office furniture company to be recognized. Last August, they were on the KLD Index, which uh, deal with environmental, social, and uh, governance performance. And most organizations have a corporate belief or value statement. There's one or two pages. I just wanted to hold this up. This is Herman Miller's 30-page uh, value statement, and I know Bob will uh, talk more about that. And before I uh, introduce Bob, I'd like to introduce his colleague, Wayne Baxter, who came uh, down with him, and uh, Bob tells me to take all the hard questions at the end. But uh, it's our pleasure to introduce uh, Robert Nyheis, Senior Program Manager at Herman Miller. He has 17 years at experience at Herman Miller. He's a graduate of uh, our opponent from last Saturday. That's all we'll say about that on that topic. Uh, he started his career at Federal Mogul, worked then at Prince Corporation, which is now a Johnson Controls subsidiary. His topic tonight, as you can see, values-based decision-making. Please join me in giving a Notre Dame welcome to Bob Nyheis. Well, thank you very much. Um, Pat assured me that he wouldn't say anything about where I am an alumni from, but I can see that that didn't happen. So hopefully things will go better tonight for, uh, for me than that. Uh, before I get started, uh, I'd like some idea of how many of you have heard of Herman Miller before? All right. How many of you, if you've heard of Herman Miller, know what products Herman Miller makes? And then how many of you own a Herman Miller product? Well, all right. Well, that helps me, uh, that helps me orient uh, my talk tonight a little bit. Um, I see I have a lot of training to do, so thank you. Um, it was interesting you said that the website uh, that you cited was from September 4th. Here's a clip out of the USA Today that I caught on September 4th also. And I'm just going to read this. It's hard to see the exact moment that I went over the line. But looking backwards, it is amazing for me to see how far I strayed and how I did not see it at the time. So much of what happens in Washington stretches the envelope, skirts the spirit of the rules, and lives in the loopholes. But even by those standards, I blundered farther than those excesses would allow. And that was a statement that Jack Abramoff made to the judge as he was being sentenced to four years in prison. And it's the environment that Jack lived in that I believe uh, contributed to, uh, to where he eventually ended up. What did he do? He was influential. He was an influential Washington lobbyist that liked to peddle political favors for uh, skybox tickets for expensive golf outings and, uh, and really other expensive, expensive gifts, uh, political favors. So four years in jail. Values-based decision-making. What comes to mind when you hear these words? I'm not here tonight to talk to you about the obvious, the legal versus the illegal or the moral versus the immoral. I'm not even here to talk about the really big decisions that we all face in life. I'm here to talk about the little decisions that we make every day. The little decisions that have a cumulative effect on our everyday lives. Ones that at the time you'd never suspect would have either a more moral or legal implication, but ones that, that you never know whether or not you've made the right decision or the best decision. 
I'd like to share a few of the little decisions I was faced with during my responsibilities as the project manager for the development of this chair, the Mira chair. This is the chair that uh, we worked on for about three years from the fall of 2000 to August of 2003. And then before I go any further, other than a U of M grad, I want to make one thing very clear. I'm not a psychologist. I'm an engineer. I started my career by designing computer interfaces for process equipment. After a few years of doing that, I changed directions. I went to be a quality engineer and then a quality manager, and I worked in uh, production supervision, production management, and then a new product launch in the automotive world. And then I moved to Herman Miller as a manufacturing engineer, and for the last 10 years, I've been working as a project manager. I also want to assure you that I don't stand here tonight having all the answers. I've made a lot of mistakes in my career. And Herman Miller hasn't done everything right either. Herman Miller is on a journey, as am I. What I wanted to give you is a glimpse of what kind of an organization Herman Miller is, give you some sense of the types of responsibilities that I have, and it's within that context, then, that I want to talk about, um, draw some illustrations for tonight's talk. I do believe that much, if not most, of who we are is shaped by decisions we've made in the past, the vast majority of which are small ones. I'm sure we can all point to major decisions that we've made that have influenced where we are today, where we ended up going to school, how big of a student loan do I take out, where am I going to live? Who am I going to live with? Those are big decisions. However, we make tons of decisions on a daily basis that, think, that I think have an even larger cumulative effect on who we are. We make these types of decisions every day without thinking about them or really realizing how big of an impact they can have. My goal tonight is to give you a sense of how I think we make these little decisions. What I want to give you guys is a picture, a context of the work environment that, that I live in at work. What type of an organization Herman Miller is and what type of an impact it's had on me and the decisions I've had to make. Herman Miller began its existence as a star furniture manufacturing in 1905. In 1923, a young man named D.J. Dupree convinced his father-in-law Herman Miller, to buy a controlling interest in the company. Herman Miller was making traditional period furniture reproductions at the time. Uh, but along comes October 1929. The stock market begins to collapse. Sounds familiar? It's the start of the Great Depression. Early in 1930, DJ meets a young designer, Gilbert Rohde, in their showroom in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And Gilbert convinces DJ to, to transform Herman Miller Company from one of making period reproductions into making furniture, making modern furniture, furniture that could solve problems that existed in people's lives, designed not for the sake of art, but for the sake of actually improving our lives. This was a really big decision in our corporate past. There's a small decision that I'd like to talk about, though. In 1927, a key employee of Herman Miller passed away. He was called a millwright, someone that was responsible for keeping the machinery running. DJ, at that time, made a decision to go visit his widow. His widow asked him an interesting question. She said, do you mind if I read to you some of my husband's poetry. That so impressed DJ that here this, this employee of his that had worked for years, kept his machinery running, was actually a poet, that DJ concluded out of that, he said, we are all extraordinary. And that Millwright story, if you're a Herman Miller employee, that Millwright story is extremely important because it, in 1927, formed some of the very moral fiber that Herman Miller has today. It was one small decision that DJ made 
but it was one based on his values. What I want to touch on are three specific values that have evolved out of this moral fiber. They are inclusiveness, design, and a respect for the environment. DJ, seated in the middle, seated in the middle between his two sons, Max and Hugh, ran the company from 1923 to 1960 for 37 years. Max and Hugh ran the company from 1960 until 1990. I want you to listen to some of these quotes. On inclusiveness, a corporation should be rightly judged by its humanity. DJ said this in 1950. We strongly believe that the diversity of the population must be reflected in our company's population. Max said that in 1989. I came across this quote on design that DJ quoted to someone that was writing a book back in the 1970s on design. I just, I found this phenomenal. I had never heard this before. For design, we came to believe that faddish styles and early obsolescence are forms of design immorality and that good design improves quality and reduces cost because it achieves long life which makes for repeatable manufacturing. By good design, I mean design that is simple and honest. Materials should be used properly. Wood should be treated as wood. Plastic as plastic. Metal as metal. Things should look, look like what they are with no fakery, no embellishment other than the material itself properly finished. I just, I, I just found that. We talk about design and design heritage all the time at Herman Miller, and that just really resonated with me. And then on the environment, DJ said, we shall be good stewards of the envi environment. He said that in 1953. It's out of this heritage, it's out of this environment, our current president and C CEO, Brian Walker, three years ago fashioned a document that he entitled Things That Matter, Incomplete Thoughts About Herman Miller. It attempted to put into words the foundational underpinnings of what, what type of an organization Herman Miller is and what type of an organization we will aspire to be. It was divided into nine statements. And they were titled, Curiosity and Exploration, Design, A Better World, Performance, Relationships, Transparency, Engagement, Inclusions, and Foundations. Here's what Brian had to say for these three areas. Inclusiveness, Design, and a Better World. Inclusiveness. To succeed as a company... Now, this is Brian talking three years ago. To succeed as a company, we must include all the expressions of human talent and potential that society offers, valuing along the way the whole person and everything each of us has to offer, obvious or not so obvious. We believe that every person should have the chance to realize his or her potential regardless of color, gender, age, sexual orientation, educational background, weight, height, family status, skill level, the list goes on and on. When we are truly inclusive, we go beyond toleration to understanding all the qualities that make people who they are. That makes us unique and most important, that unites us. It's a pretty, pretty bold statement, pretty broad statement, pretty far-reaching statement. Um, design. This is what Brian had to say about design. Design at Herman Miller is a way of looking at the world and how it works or doesn't. It's a method for getting something done, for solving a problem, for conducting a customer visit, for presenting a report. To design a solution rather than simply devising one requires research, thought, sometimes starting over, listening, and humility. Sometimes design results in memorable occasions, Timeless chairs are really fun parties. Design isn't just the way something looks. It isn't just the way something works either. Design is a big deal at Herman Miller. A better world. 
This is at the heart of Herman Miller and the real reason why many of us come to work every day. We contribute to a better world by pursuing sustainability and environmental wisdom. Environmental advocacy is part of our heritage and a responsibility we gladly bear for future generations. We reach for a better world by giving time and money to our communities and causes outside the company through becoming a good corporate citizen worldwide and even in the not-so-simple act of adding beauty to the world. By participating in the effort, we lift our spirit and the spirits of those around us. Again, it's not just about recycling. It's not just about um, creating a smaller carbon footprint. It's a very broad uh, category for us. Tonight, I want to take a look at tonight. I want to take a look at these three areas and share with you how some of the decisions I made during the development and launch of the Mirror Chair stack up against these foundational tenets at Herman Miller. Now, remember the time period I told you about when we launched this chair: fall of 2000 to August of 2003. Not a great time in our economy, not a great time in our country. Herman Miller at the time started out at being a $2 billion a year company. We shrank to less than a billion and a half dollars, a 25% reduction in sales. Our staff went from 8,000 to something less than 6,000. It was a tough time for us. So the three areas that I want to talk about tonight. Inclusiveness, design, and the environment, and some of the, uh, some of the choices that I had to make uh, while we were designing the chair. Inclusiveness. This is one where I felt I had done a really pretty good job. Herman Miller has a long history of having high goals and high expectations for buying our components from minority-owned and operated suppliers. Herman Miller actually has very little basic manufacturing processes, especially when it comes to making chairs. We design the components, the pieces and parts that go in, and buy the tooling that our suppliers use to manufacture the components. We then ship all of these components into our assembly plant and put them together. And then we send the product, the finished product, off on its way to its end customer. Our corporate supply management group gives us a group of suppliers that we can use which is then our responsibility as a project team to find the best supplier. We measure ourselves in terms of minority content. We did a pretty good job on Mira. From a dollar standpoint, over 30% of our content was from a minority owned or operated supplier. I'm thinking to myself, not a bad job, Bob. You and the team did a pretty good job. Roll forward five years. I run into our executive VP at a small restaurant downtown Holland early one morning last week. He invited me to sit down with him, and I said, nah, thanks, I've got to work on this talk. And he said, oh, really? What talk is that? And I said, well, I, I get to go down to Notre Dame and uh, talk to them about values and how we make decisions. He goes, oh, really? Sit down. I said, no, that's all right. And he says, sit down, Bob. I said, all right, I'll sit down. He said, do you know what you're going to talk about? And I said, yeah. And, and before I could get the word out of my mouth, he said, inclusiveness. And I said, yeah, all right. And then before I could say anything else, he said, all right. He said, as you've managed the budgets that I've given you, my budgets average about a million and a half dollars a year. He says, as you manage your budgets, how often do you take into account inclusiveness? He said, that's what I thought. He said, I get measured every year, every quarter, on how my overall budget, probably a 25 or $30 million a year, I get measured every year on how well I do from an inclusiveness standpoint. He says, how well did you do, Bob? I said, I guess not very good.
And then, you know, I, I was thinking back over the, over the Mira launch, over those three years, and I thought, you know, I couldn't remember one time where inclusiveness came to mind as I was doling out this, hundred, this million and a half dollars a year to a, our designers and our suppliers. And then I thought back over the past five years when I really should have known better, and I thought about, all right, for the past five years on the next chair program that we're rolling out next month, how much did inclusiveness come into, come into account when I was dishing out those monies? There was just one time I could think of where I had a choice. Do I pick a contract engineering source that was local to West Michigan, or do I pick one that was being kind of pushed on me from India? I picked the West Michigan one. Lots of daily little decisions I make on how to spend my budget scratch up a big goose egg for me on inclusiveness. Design. In our business, design and Herman Miller are synonymous. It's who we are to the outside world. Herman Miller doesn't employ any designers. That's not how our leadership has chosen to do business. We hire designers as independent contractors. Back in the late 40s and early 50s, this policy was reinforced and has been in place ever since. Most of the names of our designers you wouldn't recognize other than maybe Charles and Ray Ames. But our designers have their own businesses. They own their own facilities. They have their own staff. They're typically very small operations. They're located in cities like Los Angeles, New York, and London, San Francisco, Minneapolis, and that group of individuals up there is 7.5. That's the name of their design firm. They're located in Berlin. They were the designers for the mirror chair. They're passionate people, but they're not engineers. That's our job at Herman Miller. We take their ideas and transform them into viable commercial products that solve problems and will last a lifetime. Herman Miller, by the way, has a 12-year warranty on all of its products. That means we stand behind and will repair or replace any of our products. All the furniture that you guys see in the office area here, the Resolve Systems furniture, the mirror chairs, it pretty much has a guarantee for life. 12 years is a long time in this environment. There are trade-offs, lots of them, and the project manager is right in the middle of most of them. The design process usually starts out with some mutually agreed upon objectives and the designer submits a visual model, sometimes a full scale model, sometimes a half scale. Early on in the project, the designer has a number of meetings with our engineers and we set up some general direction on materials and performance requirements. Again, designers are not engineers, nor are engineers designers. It's my job to inject myself into the middle of that designed in conflict and help mediate the work. It's not easy. There's no handbook to help me do that. I need to rely on my past engineering training and experience. I need to rely on my experiences with the designers. I need to know what makes them tick. I usually have them over to my house. I go out for dinner with them. I take them out on my boat occasionally. I need to understand what areas of their design they're willing to fall on their sword for, and which ones that they can, uh, they can agree to bend a little bit on if it solves a particular engineering problem. Here's an example from the mirror chair. This is the tilt mechanism that's underneath this chair. Our designer was compassionate that the back half of this tilt be made out of cast aluminum. It, um, the upside is part simplicity, lots of control over what the part looks like from the outside, maximizes the opportunity to make a beautiful and honest part. Remember back what DJ said about uh, design? The downside about that, the parts are relatively expensive and the tooling usually, usually doesn't last very long. It usually needs to be replaced every 75 to 100,000 shots. Compare that to an injection molded part where you get a million shots out of a tool or a progressive die that makes a steel stamp part. You get a million shots out of that. 
Every 75 or 100,000 shots on an aluminum tool, you have to replace the tool. Now, that may not sound, that may sound like an awful lot of parts for you. Remember, on these chairs, we make 5,000 of them a week. Aaron chairs, another big seller for Herman, we make probably 12,000 a week. So on aluminum components, we go through our die-cast tooling pretty quickly. Our chief seating engineer who is now, by the way, our vice president of product development, was adamant that the tilt structure needed to be steel and that we would cover it with plastic parts. Think back again to what DJ had to say. Based on his experience with automotive seat systems and complex me mechanisms, in order for us to meet our cost targets for the product and to meet the program timing requirements that were given to me, he said we had to use steel. His decision, it was his decision, his decision, and we all better deal with it. That's the life of what you get injected into between engineers and designers quite often. Well, our designer wasn't a happy camper, to say the least. In fact, in a back hallway at Herman Miller, he took the full force of his frustration and anger out on me as he vented about that. I didn't debate it. I didn't apologize for it. I just told Burkhart that that was John's call and that I was going to support it. Roll forward a few more weeks. John had given his engineer an assignment to look at an alternate way of hooking the front part of the seat to this tilt mechanism. This tilt mechanism, I don't know if you can see it or not, has a couple of cam surfaces on. And this chair has a couple of rollers that ride back and forth on that cam surface. John's idea was to put a solid link that pivoted up there. It was simpler. It was less expensive. It was probably much more durable. Burkhart got wind of that and just absolutely blew a gasket. Back he was yelling at me, saying, Bob, what on earth is Herman Miller doing to my design? This is my design. It has to be this way. This time I had to draw upon my experiences a little bit more at, Herm at uh, Herman Miller. I felt I had a stronger argument. The change wasn't dealing with a difference of opinion on internal structure and cost, this one had to do with our end customer's experience with the chair, how it felt when he rode in the chair. I went back to John the next day and told him that I felt he really needed to go with the designer's direction on this issue. To my surprise, he agreed with me. One for the engineer, one for the designer, and I got yelled at for both of them. Did I make the right decision? The environment. About six months into the development process for the Mira chair, I got a call from Scott, a member of our relatively newly formed environmental action team. He said that the Mira chair was going to be the first Herman Miller product to go through an extensive review process before we were going to release, it to the, the, release the product to the public. Herman Miller had engaged with a world-renowned architect and environmentalist, and we had a new protocol on how we were going to score our product the dreaded DFE score. And oh, by the way, we were given a pretty lofty goal, no PVC. I brought along a couple samples. That's a PVC arm skid off of an Aaron chair. This is one off the Mira chair. <laughs> PVC was the material of choice for many, many years as an injection molded skin over a urethane foam bun. Pass those around. It was inexpensive, easy to process, inert in its as molded form, and extremely durable. What was not to like about PVC? I wouldn't have called it a mandate at the point. Our materials and engineering team didn't have any good substitutes identified at the time, just some advanced material work. What was I going to do? Here I am trying to manage a new chair program with an annual budget, like I said, of over a million dollars, 
a tooling investment looking like it was going to be on the high side of $8 million, and oh, by the way, the chair has to launch in less than 24 months from then. As the development of the chair progressed, we still didn't have an acceptable substitute for PVC. There were some promising materials called TPEs and TPUs. They're thermoplastic elastomers and thermoplastic urethanes that looked like they might work, but they were going to come at a cost of roughly $4 a chair. How many chairs do we make a week? 5,000 times $4 a chair. That's a big deal. The time came about 12 months later when we had to release the construction of the injection molding tooling that was required to make that part. No new material, no process, no supplier, and a growing swell of pressure to be PVC free. It just didn't make any sense to me to hold up the entire program on the hope that we were going to find an environmentally friendly substitute material. Our engineering director also has, has, a, has a statement that he makes sometimes when the engineers are uh, replying back to him and they say, well, I hope I can do it. He said, hope is a college in Holland, Michigan. It is not a plan. <laughs> I find that uh, pretty amusing. We developed a contingency plan that said if we had to, we would launch the chair with PVC arm pad skins and roll in the more environmentally friendly material whenever it was ready. From a market standpoint, not an ideal situation, right, Wayne? The other thing I did was to assign the chemical engineer that was on the environmental action team the responsibility of taking their potentially environmentally friendly material and implementing implementing it on our program within our timing. I was, I was really frustrated because it felt to me like we had this group of individuals that was responsible for being, for lack of a better term, the environmental police at Herman Miller. I said to, I said to Gabe, which was his name, Gabe, I said, I need help on this. I need your help on this. If we're going to pull this off in the time that we need to do it, if we're going to pull this PVC free mirrored launch chair off, I need your help. So he went to our supplier and worked with them to get the tooling to work. To make a, really, um, to make a long story short, we did find that material. We struggled through a rocky startup where our supplier had a 50% fallout rate initially. But with Gabe's help, he solved the problems. It cost us more money and a little slower ramp up than we wanted, but in the end, it was successful. This was not a big deal for me during the launch of the chair. Whether or not we were going to have a PVC arm skin, this was probably one of the smaller of a bunch of big decisions that had to be made. And it just struck me as I was talking about the Mira chair and what value systems we use that it, just, it just struck me that I would have never have guessed that going with a PVC-free arm pad skin on the mirror chair was going to be such a big deal. One of the reasons Wayne's here with me tonight is he can give you a much better feel for the market response to that particular decision. Wayne is our product, was our product manager back when we launched Mirror, has a, has a number of years of experience at Herman Miller, and spent a lot of time with our designers out in the field telling the story about Mira. And he has some pretty cool stories to tell about what the PVC free environment um, meant to the, to the Mira launch. So, for you guys. How do you make right decisions? I can't really tell you how to do that, but let me give you some things, some things that I think about. Know your environment. Know its value system. Know its history. You guys are here at one of the, the, the university, the most uh, steeped in tradition universities in the world. It's a tremendous place to be. Know its history. Know its fight song. 
Be curious. Ask lots of questions. Be a voracious learner. I also have a, a little saying that I, I have that our engineers laugh at me when I say it. But if I hear something new, I say, man, it's a good day. I learned something new today. Be humble. You're going to make mistakes. Learn from them. Create feedback loops. Ask people to give, them, to give you their opinion. Create contingency plans. What if something doesn't work? What if the material hadn't evolved on the PVC uh, replacement? It, we would have been in a mess. So, to wrap up my talk, when you're told in a class that you'll be working in teams for your next project and that it's up to you to pick who you're going to work with, as you look around the room, who are you going to pick? The next time you're out shopping for a new pair of sneakers or for some new clothes, are you going to look at the label to see where they were made? When the batteries start to fade on your Xbox 360 wireless remote controls, are you going to throw the batteries in the trash? When the person at the grocery store asks you, paper or plastic, what are you going to say? Recognize that how you make these little decisions, these little choices every day, these decisions will all play a part in shaping who you are and where you're going to end up because they sure have for me. Thank you. No, I'm, uh, I'm ready. I'm ready for your questions. Um, fire away. If we could pass the mic around just so we, uh, it's being recorded. We Wayne, could, if you uh, want to come up here. Hi. Um, you mentioned a score, the BFB score that you guys um, received. Could you explain what that was? Um, yes. Uh, it's, it, DFE stands for oh, Design DFE. for the Environment. So what we do is we look at every individual component on the chair. We take the component and determine what its chemistry is. And as we first started to do that, that became kind of a sticking point with some of our material suppliers. They didn't want to tell us exactly what was in, in the components that we were using, in the, in the chemicals that were going into the components. So it took through some time and signing confidentiality agreements that we would determine and get all that information for every component that goes into the chair. There's probably 150 components in this chair. Every one of them then has a, in a database a list of all the chemicals that are in it. And then based on what those chemicals are and what families those chemicals are, they get scored. That's part of the DFE score. The other part is how long does it take to take this thing apart? Recyclability is a big deal for us. So um, we have goals in how long it takes us to take something apart so that at the end of its product life, it can be recycled. So all those things combined to make the DFE score. And if there is a material like PVC in one of our products, that material is deemed to be red or something that um, we have a corporate guideline that says we will not launch any new products that have any chemicals or compounds in them that are deemed to be red by this, um, this environmental uh, consulting firm that we talked about. It's McDonough uh, Bumgart, Brumgart, Brumgart. And they have something that's called Cradle to Cradle uh, Protocol. And this chair was the first uh, commercial product that went through that protocol analysis, which is what we designed our DFE score around. Thank you. Wayne, why don't you tell us about the market response to the... Oh, I was wondering when that was going to come up. Um, well, in the spirit of being candid, the 
The chair obviously has been a phenomenal success. We never expected to be in a Harvard Business Review case. We never, I, God knows I never expected to be here today. Um, so we've been truly blessed with, with a great, great product. Um, but I can honestly say that I had no idea how well it was going to do in the environmental world. I mean, hindsight, it's 2020. The green issue is, is a big issue, and rightfully so. Uh, but you have to go back to 2003 when we were launching the chair, and then, as Bob said, we worked on it for three-plus years, really. <laughs> uh, so we started, you know, in 2000. And um, back then, the environment really wasn't something people were talking about. So as the marketing lead for this chair was my job to really put out information that was relevant to obviously make the sale and I have said many times that if I would have known then what I know now I would have definitely highlighted the environment more because there is so much to talk about with this chair and environment being a big part of this chair alone so I would have highlighted that much harder so that we've been better prepared for speaking about it now when our customers are really interested in the environment. So that was a key learning. And as you've heard from Bob's presentation tonight, it's not a marketing campaign either. I mean, we're not up here to, to sell the chair. And when we're talking to our customers, we're not making up or creating information about the chair because the green environment's a hot topic. Um, we talk about the environment, as Bob said, uh, for, for many, many years. It's been part of our DNA, and, and this chair is obviously a great example of that. So we have a lot of credibility in, in that, that uh, topic, and so it's, uh, it's great to work for a company that we can you know, boast something that really is truly part of our DNA. Man with all the questions. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, were there any other chairs um, engineered by other companies that focused on the same um, material or the factors? Like, I understand that there was a DFE score, and that seemed like that was more geared towards a requirement. But has there, any, has there been any other chairs that have been done to this extent as the mirror chair? Um, there wasn't at the time. The mirror chair was the first. But our competitors jumped on the bandwagon pretty quickly. Um, they, uh, they saw the benefits of, of what our focus on the environment on this particular chair uh, brought to us. So it wasn't too much longer after that. Um, our competitors' products uh, started bringing out chairs. They developed their own internal scoring system, again, based on the cradle-to-cradle -cradle, uh, protocol. Um, but um, Mira chair was the first. And a little bit more about that, uh, we actually helped some of our competitors come up with their protocol to, uh, to help them get up to speed, so to speak. Why so did we do that? Because of our commitments in the environment, Bob. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but we were the first company to commercialize any product in any product category that went through the cradle-to-cradle -cradle protocol from Bill McDonough and Michael Brungarner, uh, the MBDC, if you heard about them. Um, so this is a product that is quite literally carried around by those two gentlemen as an example of what a company can do by following their protocol. So we well, also had great advocacy just from them alone. Shortly after we brought the chair to market, wasn't there a conference that they spoke at that where they talked about the, the mirror chair? It seems to me it was one of the very first. Yeah. Um, I don't remember the name of the conference. You were there. Uh, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, but uh, it's true. It's true. They, um, they, they Bill put, McDonough. They put the chair up on the stage and said, yeah. this is what you all need to aspire to. Yeah. So a pretty... A, a Pretty lofty uh, uh, reward for the chair. Well, and for them also, Bill McDonough, if you don't know, is a, a highly acclaimed architect. He's actually the architect that designed the greenhouse which this chair is built. It's our chair manufacturing plant. Um, 
he and Michael Brungardner had worked on their protocol for many, many years, and nobody really took it seriously, I guess is the best way to put it. So having a commercial product that represented all their work was really a big deal for them, and now they've really built a whole business around consulting in the environmental uh, aspect of product development. So they were huge advocates and obviously tout um, the, the merits behind having the commitment through their, they're called the cradle to cradle protocol. And how are the designers with the final, you know, you mentioned there was some pushback from the designers at certain points. Were they on board with the environmental part? Oh, very much so. Um, the environment is, a, is even a bigger deal in Europe than what it is here and has been for a longer period of time. So having, having them located out of Berlin, they were very sensitive to the environmental aspects. And, and this isn't the first product they had worked with with Herman Miller, but it was the first product of this magnitude that had this much of an impact on, on their business. Hi. You mentioned that uh, you were frustrated uh, by the environmental police and about the fact that you had alternate solution for PVC as well. Uh, I want to know uh, what were your timelines. Did you have any timeline like if we didn't come up with a solution in X months, we'll go with the alternate? I had a launch date that I had to meet for the chair. And that launch date wasn't going to move. That was made very clear to me a number of times. The launch date for the chair is not going to move. So I had to rally the forces around, and it, it, it really was kind of a leap of faith that we were going to find an alternate material. And it wasn't just based on, on my guess or my experience. We had had a few programs that had been running in our advanced development group. It's a relatively small group. But they had shown me samples and said, yeah, Bob, I think this is pretty cool. This might work. Well, we're all, it's a long ways from, yeah, this is a pretty cool material. This might work, to having one that's manufacturable, that in itself doesn't have any environmental issues. So we've got to go to the supplier. We've got to get the chemistry from them. We've got to have it evaluated. And then once we make some prototype parts, we've got to put it through our test methods. It's got to be able to meet the 12-year warranty. So we had had, I had had an inkling that there may be a material out there that would be a good alternate for PVC, but it wasn't by any means a, a slam dunk. So I don't think the time frame for the launch of the chair would have moved if we hadn't have been able to find. I'm just glad we did. One other point on that, too. This pad and, and its sister, um, we were actually at the chair plant waiting for these things to come in from our supplier. They were the bottleneck, per se, to getting chairs shipped out the door. And first production was highly scrutinized. As a matter of fact, some of them didn't fit very well, and so we had to kind of re-cure them, and it was a... Uh, yeah. This, this skin's only molded 15 miles from Herman Miller's assembly plant. It's located in Hudsonville, Michigan. So it's not like it's across the country or on the other side of the world. It's only 15 miles away, which for us was a huge advantage. But the tools that we had bought and given them weren't made for this material. They were made for PVC. Because at the time we had to kick the tooling off, we didn't have the material. So as we molded these, as we first started to mold these arm pads, they wouldn't come out of the tool. They literally had to open up the injection molding tool. This is a big machine, you know, lots of steel, lots of hot, hot oil, hot wires. They had to crawl inside the machine and pull these things out by hand. They weren't real happy with Herman Miller. So that's when I, so when I, when I said to Gabe, I said, Gabe, we have to have your help on this. We need some help. We need some expertise. He's a chemical engineer. We need to help our supplier be successful. Because if they're not successful, we won't be successful. So like Wayne said, when you're throwing half of your initial production away, that's not a good thing. Do you have other products in your pipeline? And can you share something about that? Sure. Um, we have a number of seeding programs that are in our pipeline. We're about to introduce um, a new 
task chair to the world next month in Cologne, Germany, one that I personally have been working on for the last five years. After I got done with this launch, I got pulled onto this particular program. So that will be Herman Miller's next, next big task chair. We have some occasional uh, side uh, chairs that are in works right now, again with uh, the designers that we had up here. Um, we have a number of healthcare products that we're, uh, that we're moving into, some seating and some support uh, carts. Uh, we, had, we just launched two systems environments uh, within the last year and a half, so I don't think we've got any major system launches coming up. Um, so there are a number of programs that uh, Herman Miller will be rolling out. Yes, every new product development program has to follow the cradle to cradle protocol. You mentioned inclusiveness as a central value. I'm assuming inclusiveness regarding people is a crucial element. So I'm wondering how you promote it and whether you have something like an affirmative action program, maybe giving some kind of preferential treatment in hiring or promotion to minority or female candidates. Um, yes. We do, we do have a very active program. We have a director in our organization whose sole responsibility is to manage our inclusiveness program. The management of that program, think back of what I said when I had breakfast. He, it's his job to score every executive VP in how they're doing on inclusiveness in a number of different areas. Um, how is, are the money that he's, that he's spending, how, how is that allocated? The number of staff that he have that, that would be either women or minorities. We don't have quotas. In fact, I was talking to our executive VP of design about how is it, how is it that, how can we promote inclusiveness and, and not have quotas? We're trying something. We don't know if this is exactly the right answer. But what we're doing is we're scoring, the, the executive vice presidents are being scored on when they have an opening in their organization someplace. Out of the total pool of applicants for that particular position, how many are minority or women? And then that's being used as their score right now. So we, uh, we typically, when, when we recruit for uh, leaders in the organization, we go outside and we ask these outside people that are gathering potential candidates for us, we want to make sure that we have a slate that represents the world, that's, that's diverse, and then from that slate then we will pick what we believe the best person is. But, <clears throat> that sounds very positive. I'm just wondering about the possibility that somebody gets a very large proportion of minority or female candidates or both into the applicant pool, doesn't the score take account of how many are hired as well? Not yet, but that could... That okay, well, I'm not suggesting heavy pressures, but I mean you would want to see what the result actually is. Yep. Yep. Well, please join me in thanking Bob and Wayne for an excellent presentation. I'm sure they'd be happy to stay around to answer any specific questions you have. Our next Burgess lecture will be October 2nd, Thursday, two weeks from Thursday. Kathy Black from Hearst Magazine. Hope to see you then. Thank you.